So uh, I'm Aliana Abascal. I'm a psychiatrist over at WVU at, I was going to say Chestnut Ridge. I guess we're healthy minds now in Morgantown. I still call it Chestnut Ridge. Um, and give me a second to see if I can correctly share my screen. As it usually takes a few tries to share the right, the right one. Okay. Am I sharing the slides? Or am I sharing my presenter's view? You're sharing the slides. All right, got it right on the first try. So I will do my best to keep this to half an hour. It was really hard to limit this conversation because there was so much that I could talk about. Um, and there was so much that I could include. <clears throat> um, but I have tried to kind of pare it down to what I thought were the most important parts to talk about. So I really want to talk about maternal mental health today um, and specifically peripartum mental illness. If at any point people have questions, feel free to interrupt um, or you can ask questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt. I do not see the chat. I'm not good about getting the chat to show while I'm sharing my screen. Um, so if someone wants to just chime in, you're welcome to. All right. Oh. Hold on, now I gotta get it to advance the slides correctly. There we go. So I wanna talk today about uh, really focusing on the risk factors for developing mental illness in the perinatal period, which includes antenatal, during pregnancy and postpartum. And I really wanna highlight the risks of untreated mental illness, um, which I think is, you know, a lot of people are very concerned about providing treatment to women when they're pregnant or in the postpartum period and potentially breastfeeding. Um, and that anxiety and that fear and those concerns, both from the treating providers as well as um, from our patients, at times impact these individuals from getting appropriate treatment. So I really want to highlight the risks of not treating. Um, I will talk briefly about treating, but I think we're not going to have too much time for that. So I, I mostly highlight resources to, to look at to talk about different treatment uh, modalities. And then I want to talk about some screening tools as well. Um, just in brief, my focus today is going to be on major depressive disorder with peripartum onset, bipolar disorder with peripartum onset, and perinatal psychosis. There's a lot of other mental illnesses that individuals can experience during pregnancy and afterwards, but I had to cut it down somewhere. Um, major depressive disorder with peripartum onset is really defined as depression during pregnancy and in that period, those first four weeks after delivery. Um, and while I'll talk about it later, those first four weeks after delivery are critical um, and a period of increased risk of having recurrence of mental health issues. Um, really, that there's there's some literature that suggests that risk remains elevated for a year. But according to the DSM, that peripartum onset period is just that first month after delivery. Um, then there's also bipolar disorder with peripartum onset that, again, is a major mood episode in the setting of bipolar disorder during pregnancy or in that month afterwards. And then perinatal psychosis, that's not a DSM diagnosis, um, but, but basically psychosis, whether it be from schizophrenia, from bipolar disorder, a manic episode with psychosis or some other cause um, that's occurring during pregnancy or in that period afterwards. So the reason that I believe this topic is so important um, comes back to the question, like when should we consider the impact of mental illness and about treating mental illness and medications in pregnancy? Um, should we be waiting until someone comes and tells us I'm pregnant? Now what? How do I how do I treat this? Uh, what medication should I stop? Um, what other treatment should I engage in? Um, and really, we should be thinking about this <clears throat> for women of um, any woman of childbearing age. And one major reason for this is that approximately 15 percent of pregnancies in the United States are unintended. So 45%, but about half of the individuals who come in pregnant, these weren't planned. Now I say unintended, that doesn't mean unwanted, but that just means unplanned pregnancy. So they didn't, they weren't coming into their doctor's office ahead of time planning how they might adjust treatment or what try to, uh, or what their treatment might look like during pregnancy. It's also really important that we consider any woman of childbearing age, and that includes <clears throat> thinking about teenagers as well. So once we start menstruating, we have the potential to become pregnant. Um, and those rates of unintended pregnancies in teenagers are even much higher. Now, one big question comes to, you know, when we're thinking about providing treatment during pregnancy, 
there there has been this myth in the past about pregnancy protecting against new onset mood episodes or pre preventing recurrence of episodes. And the reality is pregnancy does not protect against it. We are still at risk of having recurrence of symptoms during pregnancy or developing mental illness during pregnancy and of particular risk in that postpartum period after the baby is born. Um, <clears throat> now a big predictor and the strongest predictor about how someone is going to do after they have their baby is how they do it during pregnancy. So in addition to wanting to treat them during pregnancy for a number of reasons that I'll get into, um, how they do during pregnancy will also reflect how they do after the baby is born. And so it's really important that we treat them and treat them appropriately during pregnancy. Um, while we always wanna pick the least invasive means to treat them, it should be appropriate based on the diagnosis. And the goal is not just treating a little bit, it's treating until they, they are doing well. Um, you want to get them euthymic, you don't want to be limiting the medications because of the anxiety or the, the fear about the repercussions of providing treatment. Um, this is, I think this study um, by Cohen in 2006 does a good job reflecting again that pregnancy is not protective against having a recurrence of a major depressive episode. So in someone who's been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, they're receiving treatment, they find out they're pregnant, um, and if they stop the medications, uh, and that's this uh, dotted line on the bottom that says discontinued that I pointed to. They have a 68% recurrence um, during their pregnancy if they chose to stop the medications versus if they continued, and that's the solid line that I pointed to there, they have a 26% recurrence rate of a major depressive episode during pregnancy. Um, those are the two I really wanna highlight, kind of the difference between you stay on medicines versus you stop the medicines during pregnancy and that risk of recurrence. Um, in addition, the it's that first trimester where if individuals stop the medications, a lot of those relapses or recurrences happen during that first trimester of pregnancy. And that first trimester is important. Um, and I don't really have time to talk in detail about it today, but that first trimester is important because a lot of the key organs are forming um, from the feet in the fetus during that time. So that's where a lot of individuals have anxiety about prescribing medications and the potential impact on, on the development of the fetus. Um, but that's also a critical time if the medications are stopped where that risk um, of recurrence is high. Uh, same findings for bipolar disorder as well. So individuals who are receiving treatment for bipolar disorder um, who <clears throat> stopped their medications during pregnancy had an 85.5% recurrence, which is a 2.2 fold increase um, versus individuals who stayed on their medications uh, throughout pregnancy had a 37% recurrence. And again, that first trimester is the key period where if, met, if individuals stop their medications, that recurrence um, often happens pretty early during that first trimester. Now, it's not just a recurrence of a manic or depressive episode in bipolar disorder, but also the time that someone spends with symptoms or the time spent ill during pregnancy is much greater if medications are stopped. So even if someone chooses to stay on medications, you know, there's still a risk that they, they could become manic or depressed during their pregnancy, um, but they spend about 8.8% of the pregnancy ill if they stay on medications versus if they stop medicines, they're spending more like 40% of the pregnancy ill, so more time with symptoms. And that time with symptoms is important, and we'll talk about that. Um, but there are implications of being unwell during pregnancy. Uh, the other thing, the other key thing is that the risk of recurrence is greater if the medicines are discontinued quickly versus slowly, which is the same thing outside of pregnancy. If we stop medications fast, then the risk of recurrence is greater. Um, and again, it's balancing this, you know, potential sudden anxiety that you find out someone had an unplanned pregnancy and they're on a medication that could have potential implications toward fetal development and you stop it quickly, that's increases in the likelihood of, of recurrence. Um, in, and I, uh, I focused a lot on during pregnancy, but also there's a risk of recurrence after pregnancy as well. And this, these few weeks after delivery is when there's this highest risk of hospitalization and 90% of recurrences in the postpartum period happen with those first, within those first four weeks after delivery. But again, there, 
there is still an elevated risk and recommendation that you continue to monitor closely for up to, upwards of a year afterwards. So there's not just risks of recurrence for someone who has major depressive disorder or who has bipolar disorder. There's also a risk of having a new mood episode during pregnancy. So again, pregnancy does not protect against this. Um, about one in 13 women have a new major depressive episode during pregnancy. Um, and about 7.6% 7 of women with an affective disorder have first presented in the pregnancy or postpartum period. Now, there's a lot more data that talks about depression, a little bit li a little bit less, but still a decent amount of data that talks about bipolar disorder. There's not as much out there about psychosis. The kind of the takeaway point is, again, that pregnancy is not protective. Those magic happy hormones during pregnancy do not prevent someone from developing psychosis, and there's still high re rates of recurrence if treatment is stopped. Um, so I'm going to shift gears on something that I feel is really important to stress. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I don't think we're going to have a chance to talk too much about medicines and their risks, but I think you know, that's something that I'll give resources that could be looked up. Um, but one of the things I think we forget and that it's important to highlight is the risks associated with not treating and not just the short term risks, but the potential long term sequelae um, of not treating um, mental illness during pregnancy. And so um, <clears throat> we do know that maternal stress and depression um, and this instability of mental illness during pregnancy can lead to dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and this HPA axis is really important for regulating someone's stress response, for their mood, for immune function, for a number of different functions within the body. And when the HPA axis gets dysregulated, it leads to increased uh, cortisol releasing hormone, and that itself can stimulate labor in the pregnant mother and increase the risk of preterm birth, which can have implications that um, as well. So labor starting earlier and babies potentially being born earlier. Um, in addition, <clears throat> elevated CRH can increase cortisol or does increase cortisol levels and higher cortisol levels can affect the, the baby's birth weight um, and also decreases placental blood flow, which is essential for providing nutrients to the fetus when it's developing. Um, now, aside from those impacts on the on the fetal development and baby being born early, there's also potential long-term impacts on uh, the fetus and the child. So exposure to high levels of stress, depression, untreated mental illness during pregnancy can actually impact the programming of the fetus and the baby's HPA axis, uh, meaning that um, during their childhood and adulthood, this baby that was exposed to <coughs> mom was stressed, depressed, et cetera, during pregnancy um, may have dysregulation of their own HPA axis and increase their own reactivity to stress and their vulnerability to mood and anxiety disorders. Um, now, some of these I highlighted already, but again, preterm delivery, lower birth rate, higher rates of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes can be seen with untreated depression. Also, uh, once the baby is born, um, if the mother is struggling with depression, this can impact formation of appropriate attachment and insecure and lead to insecure attachment. And with poor attachment, this could uh, impact the, the, the child's um, and having cognitive issues later in life and behavioral issues um, and slower language development. <clears throat> um, again, both the in utero when fetus is developing and exposure of the child um, during their childhood can increase the risk of them developing psychiatric diagnoses, psychiatric issues, um, and is associated with higher rates of ADHD. That also means that if the mother is um, not doing well, then the compliance with other pre preventative measures for their child may be impacted. So not taking the kid to the well child visits, um, getting them weighed, checking on their feeding, getting them vaccinated um, at appropriate timelines, um, and therefore maybe not catching any is issues early on uh, that should be addressed. Um, in more severe cases, 
It does increase the risk of neglect as well as abuse and potential for harm to the child. Um, now, again, there's a lot of overlap with untreated depression as well as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia as far as the implications. So a lot of this is kind of repetitive, um, including preterm birth, small for gestational age. Also, if the mother is unwell during the pregnancy and is experiencing a psychotic episode or a manic episode, then it increases their likelihood of engaging in high risk behaviors. Um, which includes smoking um, tobacco or using other tobacco products, using illicit drugs, using alcohol, and all those can have um, can be harmful to the developing fetus as well, or to the child after birth. And that may also contribute to them not participating, um, the pregnant mom not participating in prenatal care as appropriate, and again, screening for things that that potentially could be intervened. Um, early on if the doctors were aware or if the other treating providers were aware of it. Um, there's also an increased risk of, uh, you know, we talk about abuse and neglect, but also of these really, you know, worst case scenario, bad outcomes. There's an increased risk of neonaticide and infanticide. So of the parent uh, killing their child, either in those first 24 hours of life, neonaticide, or infanticide in the first year of life um, in the more severe cases, and in particularly in um, postpartum psychosis that I'll talk a little bit about later. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to the after pregnancy part, um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of potential causes that increase um, the vulnerability to major mood episodes. Um, after pregnancy, as well as impacting the ongoing risk during pregnancy. And, and in brief, these include the, the hormone changes that occur during pregnancy and the postpartum period, potentially genetic differences in serotonin or estrogen receptors. Certain genes may play a role. There's a lot of different genes that are being studied. Um, changes in oxytocin and glutamate and other environmental factors. Oh, there we go. Postpartum depression, so depression after the baby is born, is um, one of the most common obstetrical complications. Um, I saw different rates, but about 13% of women have a major depressive disorder or a major depressive episode after delivery. Um, and I don't talk about it today in the interest of time, but there's also increased um, comorbid anxiety. So 43% of um, women who have depression, either during pregnancy or after pregnancy, it's associated with anxiety as well. Um, and again, risk factors for having postpartum depression includes depression during pregnancy, which is why it's so important to address and consider appropriate treatment during pregnancy. And in someone with a history of postpartum depression, um, so during past pregnancies, they have a 50 to 70% risk of recurrence um, or just in an individual with uh, major depressive disorder as well. So we talked about the risks of, of untreated depression, anxiety during pregnancy, increasing the risk of depression after pregnancy. Um, but there are a lot of other factors that, that can contribute and these are areas that could potentially be addressed um, with treatment. Um, stressful life events, um, child care stress. And there are some situations where, you know, the challenges regarding child care can be addressed if there's an adequate, social, an adequate support system in place um, and additional resources in order to assist the parent. Um, marital dissatisfaction can contribute as well. The temperament of the infant, unfortunately, that's something that is uh, not easily addressed. But again, having that strong support system can help um, with managing a more temperamental um, infant since there, since there can be such a wide range of uh, infant temperaments. Um, other things that may contribute as well um, includes being single, lower socioeconomic status, having the pregnancy unplanned or unwanted. And I recognize those aren't the same. So an unplanned present pregnancy isn't necessarily unwanted. Um, intimate partner violence, obstetrical and delivery complications. Um, and this is a potential avenue for addressing early on if a woman during the hospitalization or during delivery has 
um, so, some sort of obstetrical complication, making sure to have somebody checking in on her to see how she's doing, because um, this can increase the risk of postpartum depression. Um, childhood trauma and severe premenstrual syndrome. There's actually some evidence that uh, that women who have severe PMS are more vulnerable um, to these somewhat normal hormonal shifts, and so maybe more vulnerable vulnerable, excuse me, to developing a depression after pregnancy and depression after menopause as well. Um, other risk factors for mental illness after pregnancy includes younger age and again, that poor stability during pregnancy. Um, postpartum depression, I mean, postpartum psychosis, excuse me, this is a, this is a fairly rare thing, but it's always worth pointing out because if it happens, it is an emergency. The baseline risk of uh, postpartum psychosis is less than 0.1%. It's 0.07%. Um, but when it occurs, it's a rapid onset. Um, <clears throat> and there's a higher risk of harm. Um, some data suggests that, um, 4% of these cases result in infanticide. Um, this is more commonly seen in individuals with bipolar disorder. So 80% of cases um, bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder bipolar type, while only 12% with schizophrenia. And major risk factors for postpartum psychosis um, include the how the individual is doing during pregnancy. And if someone is hospitalized during pregnancy for psychosis, and they have a 44% risk of postpartum psychosis. Um, while if they have a history of psychosis and were hospitalized prior to the pregnancy for it, the number is only 15. So a much greater risk um, if they're unwell and experience psychotic symptoms resulting in hospitalization during pregnancy. Um, there's some other factors that may contribute to it um, that are can be somewhat difficult to address, um, including longer labor, nighttime delivery, potentially due to sleep loss, uh, sleep deprivation, which is a, is a, is a common problem after um, having a child. And again, is where the support system comes in place and how important having an adequate support system is, particularly at women at risk, um, that, that despite the challenges of raising a child, that they are, that someone is allowing them to get some adequate sleep. Um, and again, delivery complications. So now that we've talked about the risks associated with not treating and the risks for developing um, mental illness during pregnancy or after pregnancy, I'm going to talk, let's see how much time, um, about some, some of the screening tools that are available. Um, these this list really focuses on the depression screening tools. Um, although I do talk a little bit about some of the other screening tools, the big one that I, that that I um, tend to use is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Um, the last one on this list, the Mood Disorder Questionnaire, is a good screener for um, bipolar disorder and mania. Um, but this Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, um, it is it's a very brief scale, but it is uh, great for screening. It's only 10 items. It takes less than five minutes, includes a little bit in there about anxiety. Um, it doesn't include um, neurovegetative or physical symptoms of depression. Um, so changes in sleep, appetite, and weight, which are not unique to depression, but are also seen in pregnancy and in the postpartum period as well. Um, it's validated in pregnancy and postpartum and in many different racial and ethnic groups and in over 50 languages. Um, this is just an example of some of the questions, um, again, talking about someone's a, asking if someone has the ability to laugh and see the funny side of things, their enjoyment in activities, blaming themselves, anxiety, panicky, having things get to them, um, difficulty sleeping because feeling, because of feeling so unhappy, um, feeling sad or miserable, crying and having thoughts of self-harm. Um, low scores, I mean, a mood episode is unlikely, moderate scores between nine and 12, mild depression is likely. Um, and so treatment may be considered at that point. Um, and 
also screening for uh, bipolar disorder, which is the next questionnaire, and then higher scores of 13 or greater um, suggest moderate to severe depression. So the mood disorder questionnaire that I mentioned is, is a, a good screening tool for uh, mania. Um, and again, it talks about many of the symptoms that someone can, can experience during a manic episode and is important when determining treatment, particularly medications, um, but treatment in general for uh, depression, you need to assess for the potential history of mania as well. Okay. Any questions before I continue? No, just keep chugging along. How long have I been talking for? It's about, been about half an hour already. It's been about, um, yeah, about a little less than half an hour, but you're okay. 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 So there's a lot of different diagnoses that should be considered um, during pregnancy and, um, and after pregnancy. And I'm not going to talk about all these in detail, um, but you have to consider just the normal postpartum adjustment um, and by baby blues you know, potential for bipolar disorder, a manic or depressive episode, an anxiety disorder, um, major depressive disorder, which I seem to have left out of this list, um, postpartum psychosis, PTSD, other medical causes. There's a lot of other non-psychiatric causes that can contribute to um, someone exhibiting mental health symptoms after delivery um, or during pregnancy, uh, substance use disorder or other organic brain disorder. There is this normal adjustment period that can be weeks or months after delivery. And there's this wide range of what is normal. So some, you know, mothers talk about having this immediate love and attachment, while others, this is something that grows over time. And and that first feeling is this this almost unreality of, you know, what just happened? I have a baby in my hand. Is this my child? Um, and that can be a normal response. Not everyone has this immediate love and attachment. And then there's these this exhaustion after labor and delivery and having a newborn in the home. Um, postpartum blues or baby blues is, um, is common, occurs in about 75% of women. <clears throat> and it could include crying, rapidly shifting emotions, be, really being irritable, anxious, feeling overwhelmed and frustrated. Um, but the highlight is these are mild, transient. They're not really impacting functioning um, like a major depressive episode or a manic episode would. Um, these often occur within the first day or two after birth and 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 within the first two weeks overall. Um, and it's thought that some of the causes of this may be that rapid hormone shift after the baby is delivered and the placenta is delivered. Um, in this rapid drop in estrogen and progesterone, and then just the general stressors of of parenthood. Um, again, you have to consider postpartum psychosis. While extremely uncommon, we talked about some of the in what situations it is more likely, um, and it is it is an emergency. Um, it requires immediate treatment. You should consider psychiatric hospitalization because of that risk of harm that's associated with it. And as would be expected for psychosis, it could be associated with hallucinations, delusions, um, potentially persecutory or paranoid delusions, um, or beliefs that, that you're not a good mother, um, <clears throat> changes in mood. Again, um, it's more common in bipolar disorder, so potentially manic symptoms may also be associated with it, uh, disorganized thought or behavior, this uh, not sleeping, and again, potential thoughts of self-harm um, or harming others. And these are the cases that we hear about, the, the tragic cases where uh, mothers develop postpartum psychosis and have these thoughts um, that their child is at risk for harm or may, or may be better off uh, not alive anymore. Um, Anxiety disorder also has to be considered, and the GAD-7 is a good kind of screening tool self-report to evaluate for anxiety. Um, consider PTSD. Again, depression. This is just the DSM uh, criteria for depression. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump really quickly into treatment before wrapping up. 
so obviously there's a lot of different avenues for treatment, um, that it could include medications, therapy, um, and other, uh, psychosocial interventions, increasing the support system, providing education, closer monitoring. My focus is really going to be talking a little bit about the medications, but that is not at all the only, the only avenue for uh, you know, addressing <clears throat> these concerns and, and mental health symptoms. Um, there are guidelines now um, that that are used to monitor the safety of medications during pregnancy as well as breastfeeding. In the past, historically, the FDA used to have these categories A, B, C, and X that talked about the risks associated with medications, but that's that's no longer um, no longer the case. And now there's a pregnancy and lactation labeling final rule (PLLR). Um, and in all medication package inserts there's a section that talks about what is known about this medication during pregnancy, includes pregnancy exposure, um, registry data, risk summary, clinical considerations. It talks about the lactation risk. It talks about the potential implications, which we didn't talk about today, on female and male um, reproduction as well. Um, so in the package insert, there's a lot of this, a lot of this information now. Um, the biggest thing when thinking about medications is weighing the risks of treatment, um, which is what we talked about extensively. Uh, sorry, weighing the risks of no treatment, which is what I talked about extensively, um, with the risks of treatment um, and not just the risk associated with the medication, um, but again, those risks associated with untreated mental illness, lack of participating in preventative measures, poor self-care of the pregnant mother, poor self-care of the child after birth, inappropriate or inadequate nutrition and substance use. A lot of people, again, get very concerned about prescribing medications during pregnancy and often underdose the medications because of that anxiety. When remember the goal is euthymia. And then also this perceived risk of medications has been shown to be really high. So there is a baseline malformation risk um, in all pregnancies, and that's about 3%. And literature showed about 9% of that tends to be due to maternal medical conditions, about 25% for genetic etiologies, 65% well, they just don't know. And it's thought that less than 1% of these malformations are actually due to drugs. Um, but when you're prescribing medications to a patient um, and you talk about their perceived risk, including prescribing medicines that are known to not have a teratogenic effect, to not have the potential for causing malformations, patients perceive that risk to be about 24%. So that perception of risk is extremely high. Um, and so it's important to be aware, again, there's this baseline major malformation risk around 3%. The numbers vary, but somewhere between two and four. There's a baseline risk of premature delivery around 11 to 12% of gestational diabetes between two and 7%. Um, and again, not treating the mental illness can increase the risk of engaging in other risky behavior like using alcohol, tobacco, or illicit substances that can have harmful impact on the fetus. So there's a, there's a lot of potential resources. Um, in addition to looking at the package inserts of medications um, to help improve knowledge of what risks are associated with treatment. I really like the Infant Risk Center app. Um, I have, <clears throat> um, it's, it's fairly affordable, although it does cost. There are other free resources as well, um, but I like that because it talks about the risks that we know associated with the medication, what we don't know. And it also talks about lactation risk, but there are several other resources and postpartum support international has free prescriber consultation services for medications. Uh, I think this is where I'm going to stop. I have a little bit more that talks more about medicines, but I think I could talk forever on this topic. Um, so I think, again, just being aware of what resources are available out there um, and that's while medicines do have potential impacts, stopping the medicine is also not benign and can have long-term impacts as well. <clears throat>